<laughs> so, you know, one of the things which I find striking about your classes is that uh, it's uh, there are some speakers who have such a uh, such a capacity to speak katha that people can just sit and hear for hours, and not everybody can do that. Now you have that power to do that, but at the same time, what you do is you engage the people. So you ask for reflections, and not only if you you ask for it, but it's like people participate. You see very serious, substantial reflections the audience gives. So that is something quite distinctive in modern teaching methods. They do talk about it a lot, but I have not seen that. Although based on our meeting a few years ago, I also tried tried to do reflections, but it requires a culture for for participants devotees to actually open up in a spiritual program and speak. So how did you get this idea, and how how has it developed over the years? Well, first of all, Chaitanya Charm Prabhu, I have no power at all, to be frank. But if you say it from your lips to the Lord's ears, someday I might have a modicum of power, an iota somewhere. Uh, yeah, participatory, it, it's true. Uh, sometimes I, I'll take the same format that I'm used to here at ISV, and I'll... Uh, induce people to participate and they look at me like, wait a minute, can you do that? <laughs> Are you supposed to be doing this? Is this okay? And, and it, it does take a, a while to uh, get everyone used to uh, speaking. One of the ways we've uh, worked on it here at ISV is to make sure that uh, just on a very basic level that our sound system is top rate. We have about five microphones that float in the audience so that oh. every and everyone's trained to speak into the microphone. I mean, part of it is just being able to hear one another is really important. And emphasizing uh, the, you know, top rate um, facility, you know, for discussions to take place because uh, I don't know how they did it. And I'm a Sharni Prabhu. I mean, <laughs> somebody <laughs> wanted to say something. The atmosphere was different, I, I suppose. But uh, yeah, it, it takes practice. And once people get a taste for thinking about the material and then, you know, giving their own uh, either reflection, which I, is what I like to say, you know, reflect on it. And then it, it develops into a culture where people like to participate in it and, you know, ownership turns sand into gold and they start to uh, feel mu much more part of it. And it fleshes out the conversation when, uh, when people are participating. I just mentioned oh. a, about how, you know, when kids are involved also uh, mm. and they start to develop in, in Shastra which is uh, something I'll talk about in a minute if you'd like, but yeah. uh, when they get involved and they can start reflecting, you notice everyone starts noticing at the, the capacity that, that kids have and everyone um, there's a kind of synergy that takes place when these discussions go on in the, uh, in the classes that I find is very helpful. Oh, okay. Yeah. In one sense, uh, just if audience starts reflecting, on an average, I've seen the, for some, an audience member starts reflecting, the remaining audience is much more attentive than when the speaker is, because the speaker has been speaking for a long time. And if the audience is a child, it's almost uh, complete attention. So that's so true. And uh, that was something which I was going to ask you. But just before this, so how did you come up with this idea? Was it just you observed that uh, devotees could be better engaged with this? Or was it some teaching skills in contemporary world, you observe that's, that's what affects, that's what works in for Kali Yuga minds, which are quite easily distracted. Or how did you come well, up? Now, <laughs> now that you mentioned that, I can't remember how I got into it. Uh, you know, doing it like that, I really, if it comes to my mind, you know, how that started, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it, but I, I can't think of it right now. I, uh, now it's, what I remember is it's, it's been, we've been doing it for so long. Yes, that yes, it's just part of the culture now. Yes, true. That's so true, and uh, it just of course when we are having courses like Bhakti Shastra and other places, there it works. I have also been able to do that because the audience knows the speaker well, and then it can, it is much easier to do it. But it also, in one sense, it's not just uh, Shravan, and then almost becomes like Bodhayanta Parasparam, 
So what Krishna is telling, and that is much more relish than ten point nine, the shanti cha, ramanti cha. So that's beautiful. So now just going back to the next point, I felt that one aspect of community building, which is quite distinctive, is uh, whenever I come there, you have so many children, and I to talk with the devotees' parents also. They told how you know you was you yourself spend a lot of time with the children, and they open up with you so nicely. So that is a major concern for. Devotees in in the in the West, especially Indian devotees, I would say for all parents, it's a concern about the direction the children are taking, but especially for Indian Indian parents in the West. So, uh, in fact, uh, even the parents themselves are not so serious about uh, their own tradition or their culture. They want their children to at least be aware of it. So, how did uh, the the children outreach or children uh, children education? How has that been shaped over over the decades? I have to admit, it was a revelation to me about kids. I'm the youngest of four children in my family, so as the youngest, I had no younger siblings to take care of or to, or to know. When I joined the Krishna Conscious Movement, I'm younger than most of my god brothers. I mean, I have a few god brothers and god sisters. I have a few that I'm in contact with that were initiated when they were 13 and 14 and so forth. But um, uh, I didn't. I didn't really uh, have much appreciation for kids. I always, as you know, I was a brahmachari for 13 years, and a, a lot of that contributed to my feeling like, well, kids just disturb the class often, and they're <laughs> they're not that useful. Um, I, I hadn't developed part of my brain. I mean, there's still many parts I haven't developed. Oh. Uh, but yeah. uh, growing up at Iskand Silicon Valley, it was a great benefit to me, uh, not growing up there, but being there since the beginning and watching kids grow up in Krishna consciousness. Uh, at first, yes, I was, I'd noticed that they disturbed the class and whatever, but then I started taking more of an interest in them. Uh, one incident that happened was, I was I was curious about whether kids uh, would be interested in, and could actually distribute books starting at five years old. So I took a group uh, uh, with chaperones helping me of kids uh, who were five out on book distribution door to door to just to show them how to do it. And they were fascinated by it. They loved it. We had such an outing. Then from then on, every time we'd ask if the kids wanted to go out on book distribution, they'd raise both hands. Everybody wanted to go out. And I also saw people's reactions uh, to these bright faced uh, children, you know, coming with us who were explaining what the Bhagavad Gita is in their own simple way. And people just buy the books. Uh, like the, uh, one day I was with these five, five-year-olds and we approached somebody's house and there was a woman out on her porch and there was a white picket fence around her house. And I, I was, uh, you know, sort of communicating with her non-verbally, but she looked and she goes, she noticed, you know, me and a dhoti and the kids. And she said, no, thanks. I'm a Christian. The kids didn't know what that meant. And they just sort of filed through the, <laughs> through the gate <laughs> and surrounded her and started showing Bhagavad Gita and said, this is the cow and here's Krishna and this and that. And she, she was so charmed by them. I stayed out outside the gate, but she looked over to me and she goes, all right, how much is it? And I thought, yeah, this, this is a, a nice program. But then uh, I started noticing all the qualities of the kids that these are unusual children to be born in these uh, families or to have come to Christian consciousness in an early age. And they had an unusually uh, high acumen for for hearing and chanting and learning. And I also found out that kids thrive, and this is uh, true through study also, there's the Sanskrit effect study, that when mm -hmm. kids learn long um, strings of, of Sanskrit verses, they go into a kind of a trance. So we started doing this, uh, we, we had um, kids book distribution, which has thrived. And a lot of these kids grew up distributing books. And it's a way in which they've been able to integrate into the world in a safe way. So they know what it is. And, but they're, it, it's within the context of presenting Krishna consciousness to others. So it's not this abrupt change, you know, there's this world, that world, it's 
vidyam cha vidyam cha yas tad vedo bayam saha. One can learn the process of nascence and transcendental knowledge side by side, can transcend the influence of repeated birth and death and enjoy the full blessings of immortality. That's sort of our theme verse. <laughs> and, so and so then I spent more and more time with the kids. And uh, there's a lot more to be said about that. But uh, community means kids. The community means kids because they bring everything together. If the kids are thriving and they thrive by seeing peers doing well, and when they thrive, then the parents uh, become happy at heart and they want to participate more. And they do participate more because their kids are eager to be in Krishna consciousness. You can see I get exuberant about this. So I'll stop there. And let you say something. <laughs>